Welcome back, day two, CUBE live coverage here in Vancouver, Open Source Summit. This is our coverage, I'm Jeffrey, Rob Streche here, breaking down all the action. Rob's been analyzing all the keynotes. We've been in the hallway conversations after hours, getting all the data and all the action. Rob, day two kicks off, we've got the great scenery here. If you, go, if you look at, if we can get a shot, of what we're looking at here. This is our office today and yesterday. You can see the mountains, got snow up there. There's a little ski resort apparently up there. Yeah. Beautiful weather here in Vancouver. Open Source Summit is the premier event for all things open source and they got the great venue. It's a very intimate event. This is not designed to be the big tent, you know, cattle car, you know, stack everybody in. This is a very intimate insider game right now. Open source day two, my takeaway is Day one, clearly open source, the top players are here, they're digging in and they're, and they're trying to assess the landscape and, and it's changing and our, our, our narrative yesterday was, the question was, is this tornado called AI going to decimate and topple the foundation and the, the infrastructure and the institution of generations of open source? Our answer was, it will not, but it will shake. Absolutely. It'll definitely rattle the cage, it'll rattle the house, rattle the foundation this AI wave is real, the DevOps wave is real, the CNCF has, they had 10,000 people in Europe, they're probably going to have bigger numbers in, in, in Chicago in November. So you got the DevOps, Kubernetes container, you know, whole DevSecOps thing going on, they spun out the security events. Yep. AI, I'm sure they're going to have an AI event. So I think the Linux foundations, they're beavering away, they're you know, getting in there uh, <laughs> and figuring it out. What's your, what's your take on day one as day two keynotes just uh, ended? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, again, one of the keynotes today was on from a Luther AI and really helping them remain open. And I, I think that you know, they made a commitment to be open, not take VC funding. Uh, I think that it, there is some realization that AI is coming and how to use those models. I think what was interesting was uh, that she said that uh, AI is not ready for production uh, from the stage, uh, which I think, you know, again, is, depends, I think your, your mileage varies uh, with AI. But I think that, what, like you said, this isn't trying to be that big tent event. It is trying to bring in new contributors though, so I think there's a little juxtaposition position with the multiple events and travel budgets and who can go and see what, especially with this economy. So I think again, uh, we're you know, looking at it from that perspective that it's truly a event that's growing, but they have so many competing events. Yeah. And, and there's really not a lot of news and a lot, a lot of executives, it's more getting down and dirty, getting in the, in the practitioners, getting in with the experts. You got Phil Estes from AWS Cloud on stage now talking containers. We broke the exclusive news yesterday about Cedar being open source as well as find and fix their internal tool. You got Amazon contributing, you got end users here. I mean, it's interesting, they call them end users contributors, but end users are also now companies. Right. So you got corporations like Google and AWS, and then you got companies like Discover, uh, Lyft, and, and Fidelity, yeah. they're donating, they're, they're companies too, but they're donating their stuff to open source. And they have a different agenda. So you have corporations now playing two sides of the coin. You got, I'm going to fund projects like Google, the, they're like the sugar daddy of a lot of projects, yeah. uh, as well as AWS. Then you got Fidelity, they're, they're donating code, so they have the sugar daddy for, for code contribution. So the collision of those two things is a power dynamic that's here to stay. What's your, what's your reaction to that? I, I think it's, it's a good thing. I think it, it will keep certain things in check. I think that, uh, in, again, especially in the AI world where we're looking at it going, okay, are, is this going to be controlled by the open AIs and the Googles and the Metas and the Amazons of the world, or is there going to be an open version of this that can be leveraged by everybody? Or is it just going to be usable via API? And I, I think keeping that check and really pushing that agenda, like we said yesterday, you know, open source is one. And I think that that continuing to catch up with some of the new technologies like AI is, is critical. And I think it's going to be pushed by some of the consumers, as you put it, the Fidelity's, Discover's, Lyft's, Meta's, 
who are all contri you know, contributors, consumers, and companies selling these things. Well, one of the things I really love about what's happening in this market with AI, and we had Stella Bitterman on, uh, on stage walking through the open source AI yeah. from the Linux Foundation perspective, is that the vision of theCUBE has always been an open source concept, a community concept, where we contribute our code, which is media, to the market, and that's been a great formula and it's been a great right. success for around 13 years. Of course, SiliconANGLE is a, is a free and open, non-monetized editorial organization. But the Cube has been media. Now, in the speech, uh, one of the generative AI applications that Stella was referring to, and I want to get your reaction, yeah. this is an interesting thread. There's a, the bullets were a powerful new class of AI models coming. You're seeing what happened to open source, Meta leaks their, or donates their stuff. You got uh, the, the, uh, the donation, Google's leaked memo shows that open source is powering and leveling up and beyond the proprietary models of, of, of AI. But then second bullet, she says, capable of generating synthetic media. Yeah. Just throwing the word <laughs> synthetic out there, okay? <laughs> synthetic media based on natural language inputs. This is where I see the content as code, vision of the cube, coming out, where, the, where it's all data, it's going to come back down to data, we'll get that in a second. And then she says, third, developed primarily by companies, and generally not production ready, which you just mentioned. Right. So that's, this is the power dynamic. Data is code, media is code, software is code. This whole infrastructure as code revolution feels like it's going to step function up. It just feels like, you know, you go back 15 years when, uh, the early Digirati and the Clouderati of cloud was working on cloud before cloud, it was all about web services. Right. And it was also about infrastructure as code. Look where we are. Okay, if you look at AI, you can say, okay, AI is code, data is code, media is code, software is code. The, uh, the data underlying everything is huge. So the synthetic idea is where we're seeing kind of code pollution on one end, hallucinations on the other, and the large language models. You got graphics, you got mid-journey, you got audio, you got deep fakes. Yeah. We're going to see a lot of misinformation, Rob. I, I agree, and, and I think that uh, the Linux Foundation is trying to get their hands around this, arms around this. I, I think that was part of bringing uh, Stella from a Luther AI in. Uh, you know, again, not part of the Linux Foundation officially, but hey, here's another, another place that we need to stay tight and stay uh, al aligned with. And I think uh, Hillary Carter, in her part of the keynote this morning, really went into what is the Linux Foundation's research agenda. And so looking at the research groups that are looking at and looking across all of the different uh, projects that are out there to kind of actually start to build a roadmap for, okay, here's the ones that are actually touching on sustainability, for instance. And she talked a lot about that and how does that map to what's going on with the UN uh, policies and things of that nature. I, I think it's, there's still a, as you put it, they're at the lower levels, the infrastructure levels still. And I think there's a need for more promotion at the app layer. And I think that's where the open source needs to go, is up stack, not just at the infrastructure layer, uh, which I think is doing a great job at this point in time. Yeah, the other thing I want to give a shout out to uh, Lisa Marie, who hosted a panel with us, kind of a community, kind of took over the stage. You know, it's hard to give up the microphone, you know how it is <laughs> on theCUBE. <laughs> she hosted uh, for me, but she had a great panel. Shout out to her and, and Chilia from Comcast, and a variety of other folks, Nithia from now at AWS on the chair of board. The women in tech and non-binary groups are here. That was a good uh, shout out for them, seeing the, um, the smiley faces and everyone's happy. A, the vibe is electric, and I think yeah. this is not a big number event, that's drawing the 10,000 people, Rob, but it's the right people, and I think, what we're seeing with open source, and we've been covering this on SiliconANGLE and theCUBE, is AI is changing everything. They're going to level up. We're going to see a change in how organizations are run within the Linux Foundation, how the business model is going to emerge, how projects will be nurtured, measured, and, and brought forward in an ecosystem way. Again, this is like a whole nother level. It's going to, I think it's going to change, and we're going to see who will survive, because there's some old school dogma in open source, and, and yeah. you got to watch out for that old school, you know, holding on too tight to the old way, when open source has won. It right. is the industry. Open source software is the software industry, unlike when we got into it, there was a software industry, Gartner Magic Quadrants, proprietary companies, yeah. that's gone. Yeah. 
open source is now the, is the software industry. Agreed, and I think that uh, it's going to be even deeper as we go along about how that becomes uh, commercialized and how we see the companies are going to make money off of the open source so that they can contribute back because I don't think there's going to be another Red Hat, but there may be a whole bunch of Hashis out there that are able to contribute and have theirs and build up a nice, you know, a nice company out of that. Yeah, but if you look at Red Hat, okay, and this comes up a lot, will there be another Red Hat? Well, I think there's, you know, you look at Docker, you have a lot of guys from the JBoss world, you got Rob Bearden over there, advisors that have been in open source, Benchmark's now involved, Peter Fenton, they know open source, that team's very focused, they're pure open source. But the Red Hat was situational. Linux came on the scene to beat the proprietary OS's, okay, and it needed a Red Hat to support it. Right. It was the first mover, but it got such scale and such, it was so important to have that foundation element. It's just hard to replicate that, and that's inimitable at this point. But the idea of supporting something, like we were talking yesterday off camera, um, we were talking about why people buy open source. Right. Simplicity, speed, what was the other ones? A few things that we were riffing yeah. on, but, but there, are, there are legit commercial reasons to use open source and then have someone support it. Yeah. And, and it's better to have the maintainers as well. So the business model right. of a freemium, I call it the freemium, do a project, contribute it, and then just be great at supporting it is yeah. a legit kind of Red Hat model, but not to the scale of a Red Hat. Right, I, I think it's just Linux is so foundational to everything, hence the Linux Foundation, and you start to look at it and go, is anything, any of these technologies going to be that? And I think, you know, I mean, you got Elon going out and saying he's going to start his open source AI company to compete against open AI. Uh, I think that's great, but are you still, is it still going to get to that scale? Could that be the next Red Hat? Who knows? Yeah. But I think maybe in the application space, you start to see people that are able to build that out. But I think what open source has done is democratized a lot of these different, uh, all of these different technologies so that companies can embrace them embed them, utilize them, hopefully contribute back. Open source is the way developers are going to collaborate, get to know each other as, as world work goes hybrid, even though know, people want to get back to the office. You're going to have global input, and you're going to have integration and transparency, and the success of software, no doubt in my mind, open won and is winning and is the model. It's got transparency, it's got community, which has ecosystems and moats for competitive advantages, so there's commercial opportunities, and there's the mission of writing great software. And the end of the day, the security aspect that we talked about China last night at dinner right. is important, and open source has proven that if you turn the, keep the lights on, you can see everything, right? So seeing everything is good, that's observability. So I believe that we will never revert back to proprietary, except where it's needed. You can have a hard top on something if it's not going to impact, if something differentiated, I can see that working. That could be differentiated software, but to make something platform-wide, it's got to be in the open source, and I think that's going to be the key. And without it, security will be a problem. Um, and that's how cloud, cloud started because of open source. If you look at Amazon, it wasn't for, it wasn't for uh, you know, the hypervisor, yeah, you know, KVM, we would never be no yeah. cloud, right? So right. open source is the game changer, it's one. And I think how they handle security and data, which essentially feeds AI, is going to be huge. We're seeing AI take over yeah. the growth in terms of the contribution. If you look at the academic papers hitting right now, since February, okay, since the meta leak of their code, since the foundation model started to kind of ex expand very rapidly, LLMs came out, ChatGPT educates everyone. But this is not just about ChatGPT, it's about OpenAI specifically. Right. And then it's like, the advancements of capabilities equaling OpenAI have, have gone crazy. I've read more academic papers in the past six weeks than I have in the past six years. Right, I yeah. Mean, it's been incredible contribution. It's, everyone's jacked up. It's just so awesome to see open source. It's almost like someone pumped in you know, vitamins and steroids and energy <laughs> into the developer community. Yeah, I, I think it is, and I think it's really uh, exposed the excitement for people to get involved. And I think one of the things coming out of, you know, KubeCon and CloudNativeCon and out of Open Source Summit is how do they seize upon that energy? How do they bring more people into the tent? How do they bring more consumers into the tent as well? And, and I think that'll, that'll be 
you know, a great effort and a great marketing effort that they need to do from an outreach perspective. You know, and we'll, as we wrap up the conference, we have this great view here. Planes are landing. That reminds me of open source projects. You know, plane <laughs> lands. Okay, another successful project. Yeah. Plan takes off. Okay, it's, it's off the runway in this case, the water. Seaplanes are cool. Um, it brings the vibe of, of, of coolness here. And I think we're going to see the Linux Foundation, I think bunker in a little bit and then come out guns blaring with a very strong AI response. I'm expecting the open source community to kind of galvanize around security and open source mm -hmm. while the CNCF continues to be that commercial piston yes. of, of innovation. I think that's going to continue to rock and roll um, with, with that and, and I think we're going to hear more of that today. What's your vision of how the future of open source was going to play out here in day two and day three. Yeah, I think it's, it's about ecosystems and it's about how these different companies are playing in their ecosystems and how they have coopetition within them as well as, like you said, the differentiation that they're building out on top. And I think a lot of that differentiation comes from either SaaS or on-premise deployed versions of X that are, have a control plane that is unique and differentiated. So we'll see how this yeah. all plays out, but I think that's the key to this open source and cracking the code for them. Yeah, well we're here, theCUBE's been here, President of Creation from day one, um, certainly with CNCF and KubeCon, been to every single one of those, been to multiple Linux Foundation events. This open source summit is the premier event for all things open source, the cube is here on the ground covering and the big wave is coming, it's a tornado, you got to get inside that tornado, otherwise you'll get spun out, and I think that's going to be the challenge in this industry, we're going to see the, the community rise up. Rob, let's kick off day two. We'll be right back with our first guest on day two after this short break. <laughs>